Good afternoon, everybody. This session, we are going to talk about travel, online travel, virtual reality travel, and everything travel related. Just to introduce the panel slightly, so Johannes is the entrepreneur, and Fritz is the serious entrepreneur who is now an investor. So you invested in Series A in Johannes' travel company. Why? What attracted you? You know, that's a great question. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of um, the travel industry overall, and, and I felt what uh, Johannes and his team were doing uh, was exceptional. And very, very specifically, uh, what Get Your Guide does, I, it, it, at least from my view, and you know what, uh, by the way, a sign of a great entrepreneur is someone who always disagrees with you. And I know that Johannes is, is, is gonna disagree with me on stage, by the way. Great. Um, but um, I think, um, for me, Get Your Guide is aggregating a lot of local tours and activities. It's an extremely fragmented market. And any time something is very, very fragmented, such as uh, the local tours and activity space, there is immense value created by an aggregator such as Get Your Guide. And so to me, that really drove uh, you know, my thinking on why I thought this would be an exceptional business opportunity. And to be honest, it's, it's proven to be the case. Mm. So it's quite different from Chuna, the company that you founded. So just for the information, Chuna was acquired by uh, Baidu uh, Ctrip, now integrated into China's largest travel portal. So do you feel that the market has shifted from kind of uh, a big travel booking flight, which is quite commoditized, to more the uh, niche players? I mean, I think that there are three categories in the travel business. You have flights, where not many people make any money. You have the hotel business, where some companies make a lot of money. And then you have the local tourist space, which is just emerging. This is, this is the third pillar of the travel business. And that's where we're seeing more and more companies make a lot of money. Um, and so the local tourist space, you know, why does it seem like it's small? because it's just starting out, it's emerging. And you know we have a couple of exceptional companies, Get Your Guide is one of them, uh, that's growing really fast. And then and over time, the, the company will scale, it'll, it'll consolidate, and, and, and it'll, it'll be like the other verticals. Got it. So Johannes, when you founded your company, your parents had to refinance their house so they get the money to invest in you. Is that a good investment for them? Yeah, I think it paid off. Um, I actually paid back the loan by now, so With <laughs> it's With interest or as equity? <laughs> no, I actually still like, paid them back the money. So, um, uh, you know, the, um, I think so, like every entrepreneur in the beginning has to go through a rough patch. Um, you know, I talked to a lot of entrepreneurs here at Rise, and it, it's really interesting because everyone goes through the same sort of like period of time where you need to find product market fit, where you don't really know what you're doing, where you need to understand who your customer is, what your market is, and how your bu business model works. And my parents were extremely generous in that they actually financed that time for us to get to that point before we could take in institutional funding and then accelerate what we were doing. Why did you decide to do what you do? What do you, did it make you feel that you have the advantage or the knowledge or Germany was a big travel destination? Why travel? Well, to, to, be, to be honest, I think we were very, very lucky to have stumbled into what is one of the biggest opportunities in tech and travel right now, I think. Uh, looking back, I mean, like, it's very easy to connect the dots when you look backwards. Um, when we started out, I think it was more a vague feeling that you know, we saw that a lot of the flight players, you know, were already sort of like growing and were very big. We saw Kayak, you know, so like we saw, you know, sort of like companies like Schooner, uh, Google, right, sort of like being in flights. And then we saw the same thing in hotels, but we didn't find anything equivalent for the local attractions and activity space. And what we did was just, you know, do a simple calculation of, you know, if you calculate all the tickets that are being sold by the Eiffel Tower every year, or the Madame Tussauds in London, or the Empire State Building, or, you know, so like people that go to Victoria's Peak here in Hong Kong, right? And if you so like calculate all that together, you know, you have a very big market, and it was clear that, you know, sooner or later, technology is going to disrupt that market. So that's where we, you know, so like set out, and so like that's where we started the company. So how does it work? 
So how it works is, is actually very simple. So you as a customer uh, you know, can either at home or when you're in the destination, you know, pull out your smartphone or you select your computer, uh, you know, download our app or go to our website and can find all the things that you can do in a destination. So anything you can do in Hong Kong, anything you can do in Berlin or in London or in New York City or any other you know, a major metropolitan area worldwide. And you can uh, cross compare all the different offers. You can see you know, who the suppliers are and how they are reviewed and ranked by other travelers and then you can book the activities right away you have you know smartphone ticketing uh, you have direct guidance to the fast track entry to the museums or attractions or to the meeting points of the tours and you always get the best price right since we are in Hong Kong at the moment how important are the Hong Kong and the Chinese travelers to your business now so uh, get your guide is predominantly big in Europe so we have a very large European customer base uh, and we also have a very large European supply base. We are just uh, building out the supply and the customer base in Asia. I would say it's very much at the beginning right now. So we are a startup again. Uh, you know, we're not a startup in Europe anymore. We're actually already a fairly mature company. I think in Asia, it's really day one for us. And um, I'm very excited to be here at Rise to meet a lot of the entrepreneurs and to talk to a lot of players to learn more about the, the Asian market, which I think is absolutely fascinating. And I see no, no reason why a service like Get Your Guide is not going to be successful in Asia because they are more, like, there's a very growing middle class. There's a very growing sort of like, you know, amount of people who want to do things when they travel and who actually travel to leisure destinations. And what we can already see right now is uh, you know, we have a very good European inventory and we see a massive amount of inbound Asian travelers that are using our services in Europe already. So the next step of Get Your Guide is going to be to capture that customer demand also when they travel in Asia. Right. So Fritz, you've been in China for 14 years now. How has the Chinese consumption and their spending patterns on travel, especially the rise of mobile technology that they use, have changed over the years? You know, we've seen some fundamental changes with the Chinese consumer. Um, in fact, if you go to a shopping mall in Hong Kong, you could probably see that. Um, but um, one of the biggest changes we've seen is there's a shift between consumers who care about buying physical products, like expensive watches, to consumers who care about experiences. And those experiences mean anything from staying at a nicer hotel or maybe a vacation rental to actually uh, booking a unique experience or activity. So we're seeing this massive shift that consumers realize, you know, it, it, it doesn't have to be a Louis Vuitton bag anymore or, or like an Omega watch. It, it, it could actually be a very curated, unique experience. Uh, the second trend that we're seeing is that more and more Chinese consumers would like to travel abroad. You know, keep in mind that in, in spite of Chinese outbound tourism today being the number one group amongst all countries in the world, it still represents less than 7% of the Chinese traveling public. Right. And as more and more uh, Chinese consumers um, generate wealth, and they start, sp and, and, and China has very, very high savings rates, there's approximately 20 trillion US dollars in Chinese banks held by savers. And, and as, as soon as those consumers start spending a little bit more of that money, um, they're going to elect to travel abroad, which is amazing. Um, and then there's a third trend that I think is, is, is also quite exciting, and that is the rise of the second time or third time traveler, or sometimes we like to describe those travelers as the experienced traveler. So it isn't just a bunch of people holding up a flag and you know, uh, making a big mess on the street. <laughs> now we're seeing very, very sophisticated travelers staying in very unique places. They've been abroad before. Many times they speak English, and, and to be honest, they speak um, other European languages as well. Um, and so, so we see those three trends that um, we think the really, really smart companies are, are going to be able to capitalize on it. Yeah, right. maybe if I can add to that, just uh, you know, sort of like one more sentence. And we, we, we're actually seeing that in real time at Get Your Guide because we offer these experiences, for instance, in Europe. So I'll give you one example. Paris is the number one destination for Chinese outbound travelers into Europe. And what we've been seeing is that, you know, so like 10 years ago, everyone was traveling in groups and staying at the cheap hotels and actually going to the Chinese restaurants in Paris. Today is totally different. You know, people actually want to stay in Airbnbs, so sort of like vacation rentals, want to live with the French. They want to have culinary experiences and so sort of like learn French cooking or have a 
wine class, right? So we're seeing a much more sophisticated group of Chinese travelers now actually demanding very different services, which I think is great for the tourism economy as a whole as it opens up a completely new set of opportunities of services that can be provided. Right. Do you feel that the Chinese are more willing or less willing to pay for experiences and services? I keep getting really conflicting um, messages on that. You know, like if you talk to BMW, you know, they'll tell you that outside of <laughs> Germany, this, you know, China is actually the, you know, you know, the biggest market for, you know, for BMW motor cars. You know, Apple, so, and, and everyone knows Apple's not the cheapest. And, and, and China is, of course, Apple's second largest market in the world, too. So it seems like consumers are willing to spend on stuff. And, right. you know, will they, you know, spend on experiences as well? I mean, absolutely. And mm -hmm. we're seeing it every single day. Mm -hmm. By the way, just uh, again, so I'd like to add to that. I think that's one of the bis big m misconceptions that I think a lot of, you know, foreigners also have ab about China that it's like, you know, Chinese tourists are only cheap, for instance. That's not true. By the way, it's the same in Germany, right? So Germans are not that different. Uh, it's like we've been the inventors of like the super cheap supermarkets. Aldi is like a very, very big German supermarket chain. And when people go to Aldi, they look for price, right? The Germans are also very cheap in that sense. But at the same point in time, people buy BMWs, right? So it's always sort of like, is it a value product? Or is it a price point product? And I think more and more, uh, you know, tr companies in the travel ecosystem catering to Chinese travelers actually move more towards the value proposition and less towards the price proposition. Right. And your monetization model is it is purely on value. We are a so like we provide value. I mean, w for that value that we give, like an Eiffel Tower ticket that sort of like skips the line and sort of like saves you four hours in the in the summer, we always provide the best price. So it's sort of like there are not other providers that sort of like undercut us. But at the same point in time, we don't want to be seen as sort of like the group on of travel, right? We're not sort of like the 50% discount site. We're the site that gives you the best experience in Paris, period. And you make money from the tour guides? Uh, we make money from commissions from the local companies that we uh, choose to work with. Right. So it sounds like you guys haven't really disagreed with each other yet about travel. Now we're Give going us to five more minutes and we'll, we'll exactly. get started. Exactly. That's, That's what yeah. I'm turning yeah. to. Now yeah. we're yeah. going to talk about the future for the last five minutes. Feel free to disagree since no one really has a crystal ball. I would like to understand what virtual reality is a big hot topic at RISE. What do you feel? How is it going to change the travel industry? You know, I think... Um, you know, um, Michael Wolf wrote a book called The um, Entertainment Economy about 10 years ago, and, and maybe that was maybe 10 years too soon. But what, and basically, in, in that book, we talk a lot about, um, you know, consumers are striving for experiences, which is we talked about, and, you know, virtual reality is, you know, a, a, it's, it's, it's another form of experience. Now, to be honest, that's an entertainment experience, mm -hmm. that's for sure. Um, and, you know, that to me, you know, there, there's certainly some, you know, medical applications and stuff like that. But clearly what we've seen is new technologies tend to be seized upon first by the entertainment and specifically the games industry. And so to me, virtual reality, that's going to resonate first and foremost there. Um, as it relates to the travel business, well, you know, I mean, maybe I'm a traditionalist. But, you know, I mean, like I really believe that, you know, seeing something, feeling something, hearing something... Um, you know, that's going to be, you know, much, much more relevant for consumers. Um, yes, I, I, I know Johannes is going to say, well, theoretically, if, if virtual reality was perfect, I guess you wouldn't know any difference, right? And, if, <laughs> of, 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 and of, of, of course, if that's the case, you might as well just be like, pretend like you're living on Mars, it would be the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. You wouldn't know the difference, right? And then Elon Musk would be right, yeah. right? You can live on Mars, right? Um, yeah, so I think it's, um, I, I think it certainly has some great applications, absolutely. Does it have any applications for us in the travel business? Maybe on the marketing side a little bit. Um, you know, maybe you can test something out. Maybe you could experience something a, a little bit. Um, and then after that, um, and, 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 and encourage you to actually enroll in the real experience, possibly, maybe. But, you know, I, 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 I think the bigger application is, is in the entertainment complex. Well, would you so I disagree. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> Just for the record. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> I disagree. I think Fritz is too old school on this topic. Um, I think the... Um, sorry. <laughs> How old are you now? Uh, 31. All right. Uh, Fr Fritz is 32, by the way. <laughs> um, so um, 
I think ultimately, uh, if we look at the travel industry globally, we see you know a billion, maybe 1.5 billion people. So like in the next couple of years, traveling every year, that means four to five billion people don't travel. And I think VR has a fantastic application uh, to those people. They can really experience stuff when they sit on the couch. So we can actually broaden the travel market beyond the people who, who can actually purchase airfare or like stay in a hotel. Imagine you could see the Louvre or the Eiffel Tower from your couch, right? You know, if you're a disabled person, right? So like you can't actually make it up the Eiffel Tower. Um, you know, I think that's a fantastic application. I agree it's unproven at this point in time, but I think that it will be proven in the next five to 10 years. It, it can be a great marketing tool as, as well, right? You could uh, show that experience, make people even more willing to see it in person. And also the consumers can even pay for it. They probably treat it as if they were going to a 3D movie to watch the Eiffel Tower. And then you link them to your website as selling them a tour. That's right. Um, I don't believe as much in the marketing uh, tool, by the way. I, I think I think VR is going to be, as Fritz said, an experience that will be um, something that you pay for. I think the first applications that we are going to see are clearly going to be games, right? So, so games that you will pay for, and they will be sort of like, you know, very similar to like, you know, what we saw in the mobile device, uh, you know, where games were also the predominant use case for a while. But I think we'll move beyond that where, you know, commercial settings within that virtual reality world are going to be really sort of like very important. I think the pure ad uh, part of it, that's going to be a part, but I think that's going to be the minority. I think so sort of like the, uh, you know, the platform itself, and that's I think why, why Facebook bought it, because they wanted to buy the platform. The platform and the applications on the platform are going to be much, much bigger than just the pure marketing dollars that are being earned on it. Right. 90 seconds left. Can I get your crazy expectation for travel or prediction for travel? So you, tr you talk about having a June sending you somewhere? I would say that uh, one crazy expectation uh, for travel that we will see over the next couple of years is um, that couple, but I, so like, I, I just sort of like, you know, I would say I, I would make one prediction, and that is that within the next three years, and maybe that's not as crazy in China as it is in the West, uh, you will travel purely with your mobile device, and everything that you purchase will be instant. So you will not pre-book or pre-do mm -hmm. anything at home anymore, but you will just walk around like with a remote control and all of your travel services, everything that you do will be with you know, three clicks you know, from your basically thumb around you and everything will be assembled automatically. I might, might be totally, that, that might not be revolutionary in China if you talk to an, a European that's actually very far out yet, but I think travel will be purely mobile and will be uh, at a, just a few clicks. Fritz, do you agree? Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with that. Um, I, I would like to add that, you know, there's tourism or travel that's related to leisure. What we do see, and, and, and I think that might grow in Asia a lot, is something called medical tourism, mm -hmm. education mm -hmm. tourism, um, maybe even um, some sort of, um, you know, child, you know, rearing tourism. Um, religious tourism is, is, is actually very large in India as well. And so I, I, I think there's other types of tourism, um, medical, religion, educational related, that actually may gain in prominence. Right, or sports, people run around the world, a marathon. Maybe sports stuff. tourism too, right. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Well.